Thank you everyone for joining us. It's going to be a wonderful morning. And first and foremost, I'd like to pay my deepest respects to the traditional owners of country. As in session one, I'm personally coming to you here from Gamilaroi land, which is where I live and work. And I want to pay my respects to the traditional custodians and the elders and knowledge holders who've nurtured this land for thousands of years. And also pay my respects to the elders of all the countries of those people that are listening today. And I know we're from all over this nation. So it's very exciting to be here together um, and to be sharing knowledge together. Thank you everyone for joining us. And welcome, this is session number two of Native Grains Knowledge Sharing. And we're, we're looking forward to how we can expand on what we did on session one to see how we can revive the ancient system of cultivation of native grains um, all across this nation and doing it in context for the benefit of people and of country um, to revive the economic, the environmental and the cultural significance of this system um, and how we can do it respectfully and incorporate it not just as something special, but as something that's into everyday life that we can all enjoy um, and respectfully participate in. And as I said last week, these three sessions are really about knowledge sharing. So this isn't about one particular group, definitely not me, giving a lecture. This is definitely about coming together and sharing different types of knowledges to go forward as, as one together um, and benefiting from each other's experience. Um, and I. I th mentioned this last week and I'd like to mention it again. Please do, if, if you're listening to this and you have an interesting piece of knowledge that you'd like to share or maybe a resource that you've heard of or a website or a booklet um, or a video or maybe you know a business that's engaged in this space that you think others should know about, um, I do like to open the chat box for that purpose as well. Um, so if, if you've got something and um, that you'd like to share with the whole group, and there is hundreds of people that are going to be listening to this from all over the country. Um, feel free to pop a note in the chat box about your business or your resources that you have to share so we can all go forward together in this growing space. Last session, we actually started with the end of the supply chain, which were the foods. And it was amazing to see what the women cooked and hear about the nutritional properties of the grains. And I was very jealous of the camera people that were involved in those events because I couldn't get any, but I was very inspired. And um, I've gone home and done some cooking as well. So just to put this, um, so what I call supply chain in context, this is how in a modern world, we might produce grains for a market um, or end consumer, whether they're paying for it or whether they're part of country and mob and they're eating it um, from their own country. So how the supply chain works is you start with a plant. This is a um, sample of kangaroo grass here, something like that growing in the field. Then it gets harvested and it turns into something like that. That's a um, bunch of kangaroo grass as it would come out of um, being collected either by mechanical or by hand. Then it needs to get cleaned up and that's the process of threshing um, or seed cleaning. So that's still pretty trashy in there, but that's closer to what would be able to go through um, into a food product. So then it goes from um, a whole grain and it gets um, one of the ways you can eat it, one of the main ways is grind it up. Um, so that's actually native millet flour, but the principle's the same. So that's ground up into a flour. And then finally, into something which you can eat. So this was my inspiration from last week. Thank you, Arnie Beryl. Um, this is a loaf. I just cooked this in my bread maker at home um, with some native grain flour and some kibble. Um, kibbled acacia and um, purslane seeds with saltbush seeds as well. So that was fun. I'm looking forward to eating it after the lecture. Now I've had my prop. Um, we can, um, after the webinar, I'm going to dig into that. So it's exciting. So today we're actually going to go back to the start of the production chain to this step, the growing, the field stuff and the cleaning bit. Um, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of ideas about how we can incorporate both modern and ancient ways of producing food on country. And some of these are really complicated. So um, we're gonna go through some of the issues and some of the practicalities as well. And um, again, this is not about um, a lecture um, and just, just talking, but this is about sharing. So I'll share some of my concepts and ideas that I've learned on my journey. Um, and David's gonna share some as well. But the idea is please take what's in this webinar and incorporate it and discuss it um, with your own, um, in your own context, with your business partners, um, with your family, with your elders, um, whoever, whoever is in on your country where you live and work, 
discuss it with them before applying it straight away. Um, some of the practicalities will be different, obviously different plant species in different parts of Australia, um, but also some of the, um, the cultural implications of what we talk about might be slightly different in your context and also some of the economic things, particularly if you're in a higher rainfall or a lower rainfall area, that will change the economics of what you might want to do. So um, please take what we're talking about. Um, most of what we're talking about is based up here on Gomorrah country, um, but take that and put it into your own context. And, um, and yeah, please do discuss. And if you have ideas and resources, like I said, from your country, please pop them in the chat box as we go. One more quick warning. Um, this webinar probably will be a little bit more than an hour. Um, David and I discussed what we're going to say and, and we both thought, look, this is really important. We don't want to skip over any of it. So it will be a little more than an hour. Um, we're not offended if you have to leave at any point. This whole webinar will go up and be able to be downloaded at the end if you have to leave before it's finished. Um, so having said that, I'd like to introduce David Carr from Stringy Bark Ecological. David has over 30 years experience and he's a specialist in ecological restoration. He does this both on country and also in experiments. And he's worked for Greening Australia, Land Care, Catchment Management Authorities. And he is a full time field based restoration ecologist. So we're really privileged to have him here um, and he's volunteering his time to give this webinar today. So thank you very, very much, David. And we're really honoured to have some of your thoughts on native grasses and restoring ecology here today. Over to you, David. Thanks very much. Angela. I hope uh, everyone could see me clearly enough. Um, I'm, uh, I'm coming to you from Armidale. I'm on Annawan land today. Um, most of my work for the, for the last 30 years has been done here on Annawan land or Camilleroy land or Wiradjuri land. Um, I'm, uh, my experience is mostly in northern, northern New South Wales and I work, uh, I work out of Armidale here. So I'm going to talk to talk to you about some of my experience with uh, with native grasses from the the identification stage through to the the collection and, and processing of the grass seed. I'm really excited about the the prospects of um, of native grasses as a as a food for for people. Um, it's it's exciting because it's a very new area, but at the same time it's a very very old area because people have been doing this for um, tens of thousands of years and then all of a sudden we've just discovered it again so it's like uh, what's old is new. Um, what I'm really excited about with with um, using native grasses is to put a bit of make agriculture a little bit more sustainable when we grow uh, grow our crops at the moment they tend to be fairly high intensity they tend to be one species at a time there's a lot of bare ground in the in the different cycles and I'm very interested in the, the, the possibilities to grow perennial uh, grain crops using, using native grasses. So we've got a little presentation that I'm going to work through. So if, uh, if we can get that, um, that presentation up uh, to start with, uh, that would be good. So this is uh, the first slide I've got up here is some, um, some native uh, feather grass, which grows up uh, here on the Northern Tablelands as the frost is thawing there uh, on, the, on the grass. Go to the next slide, please, Cara. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is a little bit about what grasses we can collect. And remember, this is Northern New South Wales. So those of you who aren't from this area, you'll have other, um, you'll have other grass species. But some of the grasses I'm talking about are uh, a fairly widespread, at least across Eastern Australia. Um, I'm going to talk about the sort of environments that grasses grow in and the communities that they occur in. I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in harvesting native grasses. Um, I harvest uh, uh, small scale, I'm harvesting for revegetation and ecological restoration projects. So I'm talking in the terms of hundreds of kilos, not like the grass harvest that's going on around Australia called the wheat harvest, which is in the, um, the hundreds of millions of tonnes, but maybe we'll get to that. I'm going to talk a little bit about cleaning and Angela's going to um, give some other examples of, of cleaning of, of seeds and how we process them and get them through to, uh, to a nice clean product. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about seed production areas, about growing seed, uh, pure stands of seed uh, as a crop, so that we can then use that seed to then grow our, our larger uh, crops. I'll talk a little bit about sowing, but um, uh, not, not too much. And then I, I just want to touch on the idea of how we might turn native grains into part of our uh, agricultural uh, systems. So we move on to the next slide. Please, Cara. So, in in the world, there's there's around twelve thousand five hundred different grass species, and that's changing fairly regularly because uh, botanists uh, often look at these things and decide that they're actually one one species might have might have to be split into two or three different species. So, so the names of plants change change quite a bit. And the grasses include, you know, things that uh, we're, we're well used to as food sources like wheat and corn. Um, it includes useful products like bamboo. Uh, we know of grasses as, as cattle feed. But we have this huge resource in Australia of, of native grasses that, that has been known as a food source, for, as I said, for tens of thousands of years. But to, um, to modern society, it's not included as a as a food source, and this is typical of a lot of our Australian uh, Australian native foods, uh, which are only sort of, uh, apart from macadamias, uh, most of our native foods aren't really in large scale production. So not all of our grasses are uh, suitable for human consumption. And that may be because they're just not, um, they're not very palatable. They're not, they're not the sort of grasses you would make into uh, a, a product. But quite often, it's it's about the the collection or the habit of the the um, the way the grasses grow that that makes them either difficult to collect or difficult to process or difficult to sow. And a lot of our Australian grasses fall into into this category. So, for example, we look at the uh, the grass up there on the the top right of the slide. That's that's a grass, one of the uh, the bamboo grasses. It's called Ostrostipa ramosissima, and it's got very, very hairy seeds. So they have very long horns and a very tiny grain. Um, Angela's gonna talk a little bit more later about the structure of a grass uh, plant and the flowers around grass, but I'm just gonna use some very generic uh, terms at the moment. So when we collect that, um, what we get is, is quite a difficult um, uh, grass seed to handle. You know, it's easy to collect, but it's quite hard to then uh, sow it by putting it through a machine or it's very hard to uh, to process because there's a lot of um, a, a lot of other material. Now, I'm not sure if you can actually see me in this uh, in the uh, in the slide, if, or you're just seeing the presentation. I'm not sure how it goes, but anyway, I'm holding up a little bunch of uh, of grass seed that I collected, which is um, like this sort of stuff that's on here. Very hairy, very clumping. It all sticks together as a a big mass of, of seed. Um, so it can be quite hard to handle under you know, conventional um, methods. Similarly, the one there that I've got, I've said is too fluffy. That's uh, Dicanthium setosum. It's one of the blue grasses. It's actually a threatened species. It grows on the, the Northern Tablelands here. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, got very fluffy seeds. So they're, they're quite light and fluffy. And uh, that, seed that I was just holding up includes um, some of that fluffy bluegrass seed, the, the uh, Queensland, Queensland bluegrass, which is quite a common one. So it's got quite a, a palatable uh, seed in there, but there's a lot of fluff you've got to get through to get to it. The one uh, in the middle there is Aristida, one of the wire grasses. It's got very sharp horns and a very sharp point on the, on the grass seed. And this is the one that you'll find in your socks after you've been through a walk through a lot of our forest country up here. Um, very, and it sticks into sheep and it, it's uh, um, quite painful when it sticks into you. It's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it's got quite a reasonable sized grain and I think it may have potential as a, as a, a grain crop, but it's, again, it's got all these horns and things that, that stick on there. So you can't just harvest it straight up and, uh, and, and use it straight away. Uh, the one on the, the bottom right, the, uh, perhaps this is the Goldilocks grass, it's, it's just right. Um, this is one of the panics. This is a grass called Panicum buncei. 
and uh, it, it has quite a large uh, grain uh, there. It's easily harvested, it hangs down nice, nicely. It looks, sort of looks a bit like rice um, and it, it'll sit above the, the leaves. Um, it's got um, not too many hairs or, or horns that make it difficult to collect. So it's a reasonably easy one uh, to collect. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Cara? Now this one is uh, one a lot of people will be familiar with. This is uh, this is kangaroo grass. Now kangaroo grass once was one of the dominant grasses throughout uh, eastern Australia, and when Europeans arrived and with their sheep, the sheep went through and hoovered up the grass and. Um, Mitchell and others talk about, and I'm referring here to uh, Bruce Pascoe's uh, Dark Emu uh, book, uh, talked about um, uh, graziers uh, refer to kangaroo grass as one of the mainstay grasses of almost every unimproved pasture in the country, and that they were uh, luxuriant pasturage right through the country. Now, as those sheep came through and ate down that luxuriant pasturage, they also ate out a lot of the growing tips of kangaroo grass, which is above the ground, to the point where kangaroo grass was, was reduced to, from being a dominant grass to being a, a minor component of the grasses. And so we've lost kangaroo grass from a lot of areas. And so as a result, um, it, it was, uh, Bruce Pascoe refers to um, uh, one naturalist swept his arm across the high, hip high heads of kangaroo grass and was surprised at the handful of grain harvested so simply. Well, nowadays it is quite hard to find big enough stands where you can get sufficient quantities. So it can be quite hard work to get uh, kangaroo grass. And we, collect, uh, we collected a, a fair bit last year with a brush harvester. We collected three wool bales of, uh, of, of grass, which includes the, the, uh, the heads of the grass and all the material around. And out of those three wool bales, we got one point eight kilograms of pure seed. So it, uh, it, it, it's a fair bit of effort. Uh, now, sorry, the next, uh, next slide, please, Cara. The next grass I want to talk about is native millet, which I think is one of the best prospects for, uh, for native grains. Uh, and I know Angel's been doing some work with, with milling this and, and growing it. And, um, I'm keen to uh, taste one of those breads one day. So the slide on the left, the picture on the left shows the, uh, the head of native millet. It, it's a big perennial grass. It's a very robust plant. These heads are held up sort of up to a metre above the ground. They eventually break off and blow across the ground and that's how they distribute their seed. And on the right, you'll see the, uh, the seed there, uh, the, the dark little seeds, which look like millet. They're about the size of millet seed. Um, and it sieves out very well. You can you can separate it from the from the rest of the grass plant quite easily. Uh, it uh, um, it stores well because it's a quite a hard seed coat. There's no fluffy hairs on it, and uh, it it grinds up quite well. So I think there's a lot of potential in this in this sort of grass. And that other one I showed you, uh, this is Panicum decompositum. The other one I showed you before was uh, Panicum buncii, and I think there's there's quite a few of these panics that uh, that are easy to grow and have a lot of potential. So um, that's just a, a very small sample of some of the seeds. We move on to the next slide. I might just have a few more of these. Uh, oh, this is another one that I quite like, which is uh, tall oak grass. Now this is a, a relative of kangaroo grass. Kangaroo grass is Themida triandra. This one is Themida avanacea. Um, and it's called oat grass because it looks a little bit like oats. You know, we always refer to the old European names for these things. And you can see from uh, Josie standing there that this grass grows to be about eight foot tall. And it has these great big uh, spikes of uh, beautiful grasses with big fat seeds. Now the seeds are hairy and they've got a big long horn, but um, They've, they're quite uh, easy to harvest and they're quite easy to separate uh, when they're in pure stands. And this is, this is one of my favorite grasses. It makes a beautiful um, garden plant as well. It has that sort of 
almost violet blue uh, colour to the stems and has these beautiful big tussocks. So lots of potential. Okay, the next slide, please. And there's, there's quite a few others. Mitchell grass is one that uh, grows uh, a little bit further west um, on the, uh, the, the sort of downs country out west of Moree there and up into Queensland. Windmill grass is pretty common it, right up and down the east coast here. Um, button grass is, uh, is a really good ground cover grass and spreads um, and it's reasonably easy to collect, although the seeds are held a bit low. So what we're looking for in some of these grasses that might work is that they've got a grain that's large enough to, to be able to process, uh, that we can collect it reasonably easily. It's not going to be, um, you know, hugely difficult. Some of the grasses, the seeds are held right in amongst the, the leaves. That we can clean it down to pure seed fairly easily. And of course, importantly, that the grass, that, that it's not toxic or doesn't have any undesirable uh, effects on us. Uh, and then, and I'm sure if we applied those criteria across the uh, all the species of grass in Australia, that we could we could come up with uh, with a lot of um, a lot of species. And the first place to start would be, um, you know, what people have been using for thousands of years, and look at those because they probably come with fairly similar criteria. Um, plus, we have all that experience to throw in there. Okay, next slide, please. So where do grasses grow naturally? Um, mostly uh, we have uh, a number of different grassy ecosystems. Now an ecosystem is where uh, you have a, a range of plants growing together naturally with a range of animals and organisms, including bacteria and fungi, and the, uh, the abiotic or the soils and climate that, that puts them together. And particular, um, uh, particular environments will lead to particular uh, ecosystems occurring. So in our area here, in, in the, uh, um, around Moree, uh, the Liverpool Plains, we get uh, natural grasslands where there's very few trees and shrubs. And the one on the left, uh, the foreground there shows one of these natural grasslands up near the latter. Uh, there's a big nature reserve up there called Kiramingli that has a lot of these uh, grassland species. This is on black vertisol soils. That particular site, I've recorded 28 different grass species there, plus a really broad range of, of other forbs, um, including legumes, native legumes, um, uh, pods, the salt bushes, huge variety. And these grasslands are incredibly dynamic systems. They, they will go back to almost nothing in a drought uh, or after a fire, and then they'll spring back with rain uh, or fresh growth. And they're incredibly resilient ecosystems. On the right, we've got an example of a grassy woodland. So that's a grassland that has trees, widely spaced trees, uh, uh, growing in, in amongst the grasses. This is on the University of Sydney uh, farm Lara at Narrabri, and it's got uh, quite a range of, of grasses there. And of course, we get grassy forests and we get a range of different ecosystems. Uh, but the, the message is that grasses don't just grow in pure stands. Um, uh, naturally, they tend to grow in diverse multi-species uh, communities. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about my experience um, harvesting grass seed. I'm not talking about driving a head around and harvesting tons. I'm talking about small scale uh, machinery that's that's used by the revegetation sector. And the the first one, and, I, and I'm, I'm presuming that you can see, um, you can see this. This is my first tool. This is a, this is just a sickle, a hand sickle. And this was my grandfather's, and he used it to harvest his own little crops of wheat and oats um, on his own place in uh, Glenelg. Um, that's fairly labour intensive. Um, and the thing with native grasses is they all ripen at all sorts of different times. So when you cut the whole head off. You, you're getting the unripe seeds as well as the ripe ones, so you're wasting a lot. So these days we use these brush harvesters. Um, the one on the left is, uh, the large picture is one that we tow behind a four wheel drive. It, it runs um, offset to the vehicle and it's got a, a giant um, uh, brush like a road sweeper in there and it, and it knocks any ripe 
heads off the grass and throws it into a hopper, and then we can we can drag that out uh, out later. The one on the top right there is the same sort of thing, but it's got a vacuum uh, system that sucks the the grass back into a number of hoppers on the back. Um, and the one on the bottom right is a little thing called a grass grabber made by a fella in uh, Goulburn, and it's a um, it's a miniature version, and it's a um, uh, a little brush harvester and it's hand pushed or you can mount it on the front of your quad bike or your four wheel drive. The beauty of that is that um, it's, very, it's very difficult to find pure stands of native grass that aren't um, uh, full of weeds or that, you know, that don't have a lot of stumps sticking up or rocks or gullies or all sorts of things that make it difficult to get around in a vehicle. And so a little brush harvester like that one is, is able to get into places where you wouldn't normally get in with, uh, with, a, larger, um, with a larger harvester. Um, this, the, the one on the left there is capable of, of doing um, three or 400 kilograms of material a day uh, if you've got the access to it. And not all of that is seed. You've got to then sort out the seed from the stalks and the heads. But uh, it's quite efficient for, for what I do if I can get it. That particular site there that um, that slide is taken from is down at Guerras Creek. I was down there the other day and it's absolutely chock full of turnip at the moment. So when you've got a wet um, a wet season, you get all this turnip comes up and then your seed gets contaminated with, with turnip. So um, it's, it's a real problem trying to get um, uh, really good clean stands of, of native grass. So if you've got a good clean stand of native grass, you know, really look after it because it's, it's, it's really rare. Okay, the next slide, please. So we're talking about small scale um, cleaning and processing of the seed. So once I've got that seed back in my, um, you know, I stuff it into wool, wool packs and then I bring it back to my shed. The first thing I have to do is dry it out because uh, uh, if it's moist, it will ferment and it will, uh, it will, well, at worst, it'll catch fire, but it will heat up and that, that can reduce the viability of the grass seed. So, so getting that, that spread out on the tarps uh, is really important. And it, it usually takes you know, a week or so of, um, uh, of warm weather to dry out some of your grass seed. And some seeds are um, harder to dry than others. That native millet will, will be dry in a couple of hours. Whereas seeds that are fluffy, like the Queensland bluegrass, they'll dry, they'll dry down. And then if you leave them too long and the, you know, the moisture is coming into the air in the, in the evening, they'll just soak up all that moisture again. So you've really got to be careful about um, uh, you know, turning your grass and making sure it, uh, you, you cover it up before the dew comes in. So once it's dry, the, the next stage is then to um, uh, separate the grain from all your other structures, from your from your awns and your glooms, and even getting the stalks, the grass stalks out. And in in non mechanical means, you can you can sort of thresh it, you can beat it with a stick, or you can whack it against a rock, or all sorts of things to separate that that um, uh, those materials, that seed. Uh, some seeds you can just sieve really easily. So there's a, there's a picture of a sieve, that's not grass seed, but as you can, as a seed collector, you end up collecting every sieve you can find. So you're going into kitchen shops, you know, looking for the, just the right grade of sieve to separate out uh, different material. Um, for grains over the world, winnowing is one of the really traditional ways to separate it, where you use um, moving air to blow away light, uh, structures and leave the heavier seed. The machine on the left there is has a um, you pour the seed in one end and it has a vacuum suction going through the other end, and it uses uh, air uh, pressure to separate out the the different weights of material that are in there. And sometimes your seed will be heavier than what you're trying to sort out, and sometimes it'll be lighter. And so that's a fancy uh, version of a a, a winnower. Uh, which, which helps to get, uh, get it down to a fairly clean seed. Now, most of this machinery isn't, decide, isn't designed to get it down to food grade. This is designed just so that we can use it for revegetation. Now, one of the difficulties with 
wild collected seed is that you, you almost never get a pure stand of grass. You always have some sort of um, multi-species mix uh, where you've got uh, a range of species. And some of those ones you can sort out, but uh, like this little mix I showed you earlier, this, this, this one here, there's, there's about five or six species in there and it's very, very difficult to sort them out because they're all fluffy, they all weigh about the same um, and it can be quite difficult. So for reveg, that doesn't really matter because you're just putting back a grassland community. But if you're actually harvesting grass, that's, that's a different story. So, you know, we really need to look at um, uh, growing grasses together that actually can be separated if that's what we want to do. All right, next slide, please. So one of the difficulties with growing crops of native grass, you know, why don't we just go out and start sowing native millet, you know, in, in fields? It's very difficult to get enough seed to, uh, pure seed to do that. And so um, we can't necessarily rely on the wild uh, harvest of seed. So what we use is that wild harvest to then grow our seed into bulking, um, in, in bulking systems like this seed production area where we're growing larger quantities of individual seeds. Now this fellow in the slide here is uh, Paul Gibson Roy, um, and uh, he's uh, he's done a lot of work with grassland restoration, particularly on the uh, basalt plains around Melbourne, and he's applying that now around the Cumberland Plain in Sydney. And one of the the methods that he looked at was growing these seed production areas where you can grow um, weed-free stands of individual species, and then collect large quantities of that of that seed. Um, and there's three different grass species um, in different settings. So what they do is they grow, they collect some wild seed, they grow that seed as seedlings, and then they plant that seedlings out into these uh, weed mats, and then they're able to uh, keep that weed free, and the seed falls on the weed mat, and they can get all of the seed that they, they need then and bulk it up, and then use that to grow on in other, other areas. Okay. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, uh, the large areas of these native grains, we need to have these uh, seed production areas and gradually bulk those up. And there have been commercial companies around, I think there is still, who have been doing that for the range of species and have growers growing for them on contract throughout Australia. So once you've got your grass seed and it's and it's fairly clean, um, we use a range of uh, techniques. We've we've been using um, traditional agricultural machinery like this little disc um, seeder in the bottom right. Um, you can use direct drill. You can use combines, which are just basically ploughing up the ground and throwing out the seed. Um, the machine on the left there is a little uh, fertilizer spinner or a seed spinner that you just drop the seed in, and it uh, it throws the the, the seed out. Um, the machine on the top right is a little custom made uh, seeder that can sow a range of uh, seeds, sort of cultivates as it goes, um, it covers the seed as it drops it and then you can have a little press roller to, to drop it in. But these are of course all uh, small scale um, operations. Uh, but what we do a lot with revegetation is that we will, um, we will be rather than trying to completely plant out a paddock, we're looking at uh, inoculating a paddock. So just putting in strips of native grasses or, or other plants in that will then spread throughout the, the rest of the, of the paddock. Now, of course, if you've got a, a really fluffy seed or a really lightweight seed, it's going to jam up in these machines um, and it can be very difficult to get it out. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Cara. Uh, what we do is we, we, we need to coat that seed um, to make it go through these machines. So kangaroo grass uh, on the right is a, a fairly smooth uh, seed and it will um, it'll go through these machines quite well, but it's, it's reasonably lightweight. So what we do is we coat it with these either clays or polymers and it uh, it, throw, it allows you, gives you enough weight to throw these seeds out or drop them um, 
drop them where you want them. The seed on the left is Queensland bluegrass, which is a very fluffy seed, and it, it jams up if you, uh, if you try to run it through a machine. So what we've done here is we've, we've used a flowable powder um, to coat this one, and it, it just makes them a little bit slippery and they, they move against each other a lot easier and they don't jam up so much. And we also add um, powders into the, the hoppers of the cedars to, to make the seed um, run through uh, a little bit better. And there's some pretty good technology around uh, for agricultural uh, grasses and plants uh, that we can make use of to, to coat our seeds. Okay, next slide, please. So the question is, how do we then take this into large scale production? Well, we've been experimenting a little bit with these air seeders. This is a John Deere Maxi Merge that's used for planting crops like sorghum, uh, uh, beans, cotton, um, fairly reliable technology. Uh, there's not much point us trying to invent new seeders. These can be up to uh, 30 metres wide. Individual boxes can be used to plant individual species if you want. And they use, um, they use these, uh, these discs, uh, which are, you, you buy a different disc depending on the size of the seed that you're, you're planting. And we've adapted these um, for planting a whole range of native species, including grasses. Um, these machines are, are very um, variable. You can set them for distance, for depth, for all sorts of things. So um, with a little bit more work, we can very easily adapt these machines to getting these grasses out into large scale uh, production. But uh, if we go on to the next slide, please. The final question is, is how are we going to grow these, these systems? How are we going to grow these grasses? You know, are we going to grow them in simple monocultures like we do with, with wheat, where all of the grasses are bred to be, you know, the one height and to mature all at the same time? Uh, and then we can come into um, uh, to the paddock like everyone's doing around Eastern Australia now and Western Australia, and we just harvest it all in one go, and that's it. Or do we look at something like on the right here, which is a complex polyculture, multiple species, You'll have different species in different seasons um, that are responding to the, the environmental conditions. Um, very, very high environmental values as far as habitat, as far as complex interactions with soil biota, with, with animals with, um, and with the climate. But how are you going to harvest it? You know, do we harvest that tall oak grass you can see there in the background and, and then come back later and try and get the the, uh, the other grasses that are a bit lower, or do we develop machinery that can, can do multiple uh, species? Um, or do we look at some combination of, of the two, you know, where we're using, uh, we're sowing um, these native grasses into um, existing pastures, for example, um, like people have been doing sowing wheat into, um, into, into pastures. So you've got grazing part of the year and then you've got a reduced yield of wheat but you're still getting a grain crop at other times of the year. I think these are the really interesting questions for, uh, for sustainability, um, for you know, food diversity. And I, th I think these are, these are the really good opportunities for, for um, First Nations people to explore uh, food production on a on a large scale that, that has a sustainable uh, basis built on uh, all those those uh, millennia of of practice and I think that's the that's the really exciting thing about this this work that uh, is going on now with uh, native grains. So we just go to the final slide. That's um, that's me finished. Um, if you've got um, questions um, now or later I'm happy to to uh, to take them at any time and uh, happy to engage with anyone who's working in this space because I'm really interested in it and really excited about the, the possibilities for us thank you thank you David that was amazing wow thank you for sharing that knowledge and so practical
Um, and I, I personally learned so much of what I've learned, I've learned from you and just seeing all the photos and all the examples brought into one place. That's so useful, such a great resource for all of us, whatever country we're from, to figure out how to apply this. And I love your f final question because that's almost where I'm gonna start my talk as well. Um, Cause I think it's one of the biggest ones. So yeah. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, there are a few questions in the chat box. So if you wanna just duck through and answer those questions if you can see it on your screen while I start my talk, um, feel free. And David, if you see any questions in the chat box that I miss while I'm talking that you think I should um, make sure I address, um, please alert me to it and I'll make sure I, um, I do that before the end of the talk. Okay, do you want me to do that now? Uh, yeah, well, if you just go through and then just type some answers, how about you type them and I'll, um, I'll start talking so we can make sure okay. we can, um, try and get over and done with. Uh, before yeah, before the end of the end of the day. <laughs> Just joking. I'm not going to talk that long. I promise. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Whoops. And okay. So I'm going to answer what I think, or hopefully answer four of the key questions about this system and hopefully follow on very practically from what David has been talking about um, and also bring it out a little bit into its food, um, food production chain context. So the main questions I want to talk about is how many species and what species we should be focusing on and David used at the end of his talk um, monoculture or polyculture and exactly the same concept. I've called them food factory which would be a, a monoculture or a food pantry, which is kind of a, a polyculture concept. I'm gonna talk about threshing and seed cleaning and then finish with the question to breed or not to breed um, about plant breeding of native grains. So let's start with the, the species question. And this is really key to get right because you gotta spend, like David said, a lot of money and time and investment into starting an enterprise. If you're gonna plant something from scratch or if you're going to take a field and then and morph it into a, a production field. Um, there's a lot of time and investment. So you want to know what your target species are before you start, because um, otherwise you'll be several years behind. So how do you know what species to plant? Um, you know, I, at the start of the talk, I, I showed the production chain um, from the, what you got in the field and then it goes to milled grain and then you've got the product at the end. Um, everyone in this process needs to be a level of happy with what species they're either growing, processing, milling, cooking with and eating. Um, and so you need to kind of find a species that meets all of those criteria. And David had some of the criteria for the field side of the production and the early stages. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that even one step wider than that. Um, because happy differs between different cultures, nations, physical environments, and also your personal values. But let's look at a few of these um, voices and these values that might speak um, from different ends of the production chain. So what we've started with is you grow something, then you harvest it, then you thresh it, then somebody else will mill it, another person, a chef or a baker will create some sort of food, and then another person or group of people are going to be eating it. And all of these participants in the chain have a different opinion about what species they favour. So for example, and these are only examples, this, I haven't done all my market research to say this is a conclusion. Um, these are examples. So a consumer might say, we like eating weeping grass and purslane seed, for example. But the miller might say, oh, sorry, the, the baker might say, well, actually the weeping grass dough is really tough and it's hard to work, but I'd, I'd rather use warrigo grass. That's really nice and light as a dough. The people milling might say, oh yeah, well, warrigo grass is okay. It flows through the mill well, but oily grasses like purslane, oily, sorry, oily grains like purslane or acacia, they block up our mills. So um, we're not so keen on those. Somebody who's threshing and cleaning seed might say kangaroo grass and Mitchell grass are really hard to thresh. They're a lot of work for little return. Um, we don't like working with those species. Someone harvesting, different voice again. They might say, oh, purslane and button grass, they're too short. Um, it's really hard for us to get the header in and pick them up. But then the person who owns the paddock might be saying, well, actually, purslane and button grass produce the most seed per hectare, so we'd love to grow those. 
But actually, now I think about it, they're also weeds. You know, they, they set so much seed, then the, the seed spreads into the neighbouring paddock um, of wheat or, or chickpeas or whatever, um, and they actually create a weed problem. So I'm not really sure. Um, and then also, you can't grow every species everywhere. So for example, someone on Gomorrah country, we actually can't grow weeping grass in most of Gomorrah country. It's too hot. Um, but obviously, weeping grass is very well suited to other parts of the country. So can you see how we've got these different voices? Um, and every voice along the production chain has a different opinion about what species they would like to work with or eat or use. So we've got to try and find some species that meet roughly all the boxes, make people at least a little bit happy, um, and then try and find the common ground. And then that's the species that we need to plant um, and work on, or that group of species. Um, and David addressed this really well in his talk, so I won't go through too many of the key species that have historically been here and are currently here. Um, there's a few books you can read, please do if you haven't already. Um, not endorsing any particular book, but these are just some examples that I've found interesting and helpful and very easy to read. Um, there's also two formal reports um, put out by the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation, which is now called AgriFutures. Um, but these two reports here, one on grasses and one on native legumes, um, both look at different species and their advantages and disadvantages. Um, they come at that from a countrywide perspective. So um, some of those might have species that are relevant to your particular growing environment. But again, we even getting some background on individual species, it still doesn't quite answer the question, do we want to plant one or many species? Um, so this field here up at Balata, not far from Pyramingli actually, but this is um, on a farmer's property. And that particular field, thank you very much, John, um, he lets us go through and harvest the native grass grains. One year, in fact, 2018, that was dominated by Mitchell grass. And um, when we came back in 2019, um, the species levels had changed because of the time of year when the rainfall came and there was very little of it in 18, 19, it changed the species distribution. Um, and then again, in 2020, when we went back to harvest from the same field, what was almost all Mitchell grass the previous year was now about 50-50 Mitchell and 50-50 Plains grass. And Plains grass is one of those ones that, um, that David mentioned that has seed that's a bit too small and not very suitable for, for eating. So this, this discussion about do we, do we go with what's environmentally valuable or do we go with what's economically valuable is really, really important discussion. And um, again, this is knowledge sharing. Um, there are lots of different opinions and voices in this space and it's really important that we, um, we talk it through and do some research and try and figure out how we can make this system work going forward. Here's some more photos to talk a bit more about this concept. Um, the one down on the left, that's actually a field of chia seed. And um, people espouse chia as being an ancient grain and, and very healthy and which it is. Um, but you can see here it's grown, not actually grown as a polyculture in its native environment. It's grown as a monoculture, like all modern crops are. Um, so as far as the eye can see there, that's a monoculture of chia seed, which is irrigated and fertilized and, and harvested with modern machinery. Um, and so any sort of grain can be used in this particular system. And I'm calling that a food factory system. Factories are, have a purpose and they're highly efficient and they're designed to produce an economic output um, en masse. And it does that really, really well. And these sorts of systems are very important for global food security. And um, I don't think they're going to be removed. We have to consider the advantages of this sort of system. Um, and it's really important that we know that um, hundreds and hundreds, millions of lives have been saved by being able to have these modern agricultural technologies and techniques that increase the amount of food we can produce per hectare. Um, but having said that, we have to try and work out how we can more sustainably grow grains en masse. And how we, what approach we take with native grains is a discussion that I'm gonna explore a bit more here. So the photos on the right are examples of fields that are destined for native grains, but at the moment you can see they're a big miss, mix and a bit of a mess of lots of different species. So that's actually the same field, but different places in the same field. Down the bottom, you can see it's dominated by purslane, which is that kind of ready, um, it's a bit drought stressed there, but it's, it's a bit red, um, red stemmed grain. 
and um, and then you've got up the top where there's more of the grasses and poking above all of those species are different herbs and things and several of those species are weeds and in fact we had um, deadly nightshade in that field and also the um, the, the detura the apple that really spiky thorny um, weed which neither of which you want in a grain sample deadly nightshade is actually poisonous and you definitely don't want that in there um, and then there's a, all those other weeds and thorny things as well that are just a real pain um, for various other reasons. You don't want that in your grain sample. And weed control is one of the biggest problems in these polycultures, trying to remove not just the weeds that compete with your target species, but the weeds which are, you definitely can't have in an edible food sample. So this factory versus pantry or monoculture versus polyculture question is one we have to explore a lot. Um, so I mentioned weed control and plant competition and David covered harvest timing and harvest difficulty when you've got lots of different species in the same field. One solution is going to be post harvest grain separation. So if we can figure out how to harvest lots of grains easily into a hopper without um, breaking the machine, um, then we can do some sort of post harvest grain separation to get the target species. But we do have to research how to do this in a modern context. And people might say, and they do, this has been happening for thousands of years. Why can't we do it today? And the answer is, well, yes, we definitely can do it today. Um, and we can go back um, to a field and revegetate it, remove the weeds and revegetate it with only the natives. Um, and we can go through and hand harvest and hand collect and then hand grind and bake over hot coals. We can do that and we should, and it's really fun and valuable. And I've been very privileged to go out with some Aboriginal people and do this. Um, and I love it. Um, but what we're exploring today in the, in the knowledge sharing is how we might be able to take that ancient system and do it at a bigger scale. And the cost of labor and the time involved and the safety implications of doing this in a, in a modern context are a bit different to what it's been for thousands of years. And we have to explore these ideas, how we can merge the ancient knowledge with the modern knowledge in a way that's safe going forward. And also that protects the cultural knowledge that's integrated into the system as we go forward. Um, I want to put native grains in context with, with a commercial crop again. And what I'm gonna try and do now is compare Mitchell grass as an example to a crop of wheat. Um, so here's a photo of Mitchell grass. And if that photo was next to the wheat, it would be roughly where that black box is. So you can see that a Mitchell grass is about half the height of a wheat plant. And I took this photo of Mitchell grass on its own so you can see it a bit clearer, but obviously Mitchell grass wouldn't normally be just one, pat, one plant in not surrounded by others. Um, but if you can see on this plant, you've got these ripe heads ready to go up the top but you've also got lots of unripe heads poking out the side here, and there's more poking towards the camera. There's also some that are ripe that are down low poking towards the camera. And if you can compare something like that with heads of smaller seed, different ages, different sizes, um, compared to a, a crop like wheat, which has been bred for thousands of years to be able to effectively produce food and harvest. You've got here, all the heads are at the same height full of seed and all the same age. And so this system has been um, modernized and developed specifically so you can come through with a header and cut them off here when they're ripe. They're not quite ripe in this photo, but when they're ripe, you can come through and cut all the grain off in one go. Um, and it's, it's, they're nice big seeds, easy to thresh out. Um, and then you can collect many, many tons per hectare of off plants like this. Um, and then but plants like this, um, whoops, so they're, they're very drought hardy and they're perennial. So they've got great, great benefits for the soil and the biodiversity. Um, if you're just looking at the harvestability, even Mitchell grass, which is something which is, I believe, one of the target species for native grain production because it hits many of David Carr's targets and his criteria. Um, even then, the yields of this grass are going to be very low. Um, so production does vary greatly between species and climate and management. So Mitchell grass is one example and uh, microlina or native, uh, sorry, well, weeping grass, um, also called dancing grass in, in other Aboriginal nations, um, is very, uh, very high yielding compared to Mitchell grass. It does well, but part of that is because it's grown in higher rainfall environments. Um, so there are differences between species and climates and the way you manage them. 
Um, so whether you choose to use um, different fertilizers um, and this, this idea of a monoculture versus polyculture, all these management things are important. And also breeding can help and I'll just explore that in a minute. But I do want to keep people's expectations a bit realistic about, about where this might fit in context. Um, and please, 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 I'm, I'm doing this webinar because I really very thoroughly believe we need to incorporate this system into modern food production. That's why I'm here. Um, but I also feel like I also, I want to encourage people to put this in context and um, look at how we can include this as a food option in our global food systems. Because for global food security, commercial cropping is going to be around for a while. So we need to work out ways of how we can do this in the field and as foods um, and in global trade and do it all in a way that goes forward together. So let's put some numbers to this. Up here on Gomoro country, from our experience, if you do a single species paddock and, you, and it's in a good rainfall season, we might be able to get 0.2 to 0.5 tons, of, tons per hectare of usable grain. If it's one of the target species, it has nice big grain, it's managed well, um, and you really put effort into just the seed production in a good season. So that's a food factory style of production. Um, if you're going with a mixed species paddock, we estimate, and obviously this depends, like I said, on the season and what species are dominating in your paddock at a particular time. Um, maybe you could hope to get 0.1 tonnes a hectare, might be less, um, of your target species per year. Um, but you will have other species in that paddock. And what we're trying to research and work with people on country as well, trying to figure out, well, if we have lots of different species in that paddock, you can also have ed other edible species in the same paddock. So it wouldn't only be 0.1 tonnes a hectare of food you'd remove, it would just be 0.1 tonnes a hectare of, of your target grain. As an example, again, this differs depending on country and rainfall management styles. But up, if we're using that same paddock as an example, um, comparing it to a paddock of wheat, from that same paddock, if you grew that as a food factory style, up here on Gomorrah country, yields would be about four tonnes a hectare of wheat. So if you compare a four tonne to 0.2 of a tonne, there's a really, really big difference in the amount of edible grain per hectare. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm not saying we have to do things a certain way, just exploring some numbers to help us get in our minds, okay, where might this fit in context? And how can we take this knowledge and really launch forward with a bit more research, a bit more investigation and combining of knowledges um, to be able to take this forward for the benefit of people and of country. Um, so you might say, can we plant these in strips? Well, yes. Um, can we get carbon and biodiversity credits? So it doesn't matter if they yield a bit less, you'll have some carbon credits, biodiversity credits to back up your enterprise. Yes, well, hopefully yes, depends who's in government. Um, can we use income stacking? Can we use a social enterprise model to make the cost of labour cheaper? Um, yes, yes, and yes, and yes, we should. And some of those ideas are explored a bit more in detail in the report that we've just released, um, but I won't have time to go through it now. And there's also lots and lots of other resources on this topic, on these three topics that are available in literature and on the internet. Please do explore these ideas um, and see what one might work for your particular enterprise. The other consideration I wanted to bring up is fire um, and the role that fire might play in these going forward. And I'm not a traditional knowledge holder in this area, so I can't speak to the cultural implications of the return of fire to the landscape. But from what the elders tell me, it's very important, not only for the practical reasons, but for cultural reasons as well. Um, so I'll, I'll just talk in my area, which is the practical stuff. But I'd love to also and encourage everyone to hear more and listen to the elders as they speak more about the cultural implications of bringing fire back and the way it heals people and heals country. Um, from a practical perspective, the question is asked about should we use fire or should we use grazing to be able to control the biomass of these perennial grasses. Um, so traditionally, usually once a year or once every couple of years, a grassland would have been burnt. And the practical implication of that is that it um, removes a lot of the biomass and rejuvenates the plant. So it causes the grasses to reshoot with lots of green pick, which is quite good for the ecology of the environment. Um, and then, it, you know, the kangaroos come back in and the, and the other fauna and they love eating the fresh green shoots. And then after that, the, the grain will regrow again. 
and there'll be a cycling of nutrients that's associated with that practice as well. Um, but going forward, what, whether the return of fire to a grassland system designed for native grain production is what you choose to do, um, there'll be implications for doing that in different areas. So another alternative that's used often in the regenerative agriculture space is the use of cattle or sheep to graze down the grasses. And that also um, brings another economic outcome from the system. So you'd get the grains at some times of year and then the other times of year, you'd be able to have livestock which would graze the plants before they go to seed. And then you could sell the livestock. So I've got that point there, livestock increases the economic resilience. So that basically means if you own a property, um, you can sell both grains and livestock. Um, but there are implications of having livestock on your farm, just practical ones. You need additional skills in managing livestock and you need good fences, you need watering points, you need yards, um, you need to maintain their ear tags and all these sorts of things. So um, there are additional things you'll need if you're gonna add livestock as an enterprise to your native grain production area. Um, um, but also the, the alternative with fire, um, there are carbon credit implications for that as well. And I don't know exactly what they're going to be yet, um, but if you want to earn carbon credits, I'm not sure either. To be honest, I'm not really sure if you're grazing it, um, what implications that might have for carbon credits. Um, the legislation, oh yeah, who knows what direction it's going to go. Um, but at the moment, you, you might want to consider start asking this question now. Do I want to incorporate fire? Do I want to incorporate grazing? Or neither in my native grain production areas? So let's bring it back to that original question about what species should I plant? And what I'd encourage everyone to do that's listening, you really got to think about your priorities. And this is um, a personal values thing and the values of the other people that are involved in this enterprise. Maybe it's elders, maybe it's other business partners that you have um, or other people in your community. Um, what are the priorities for you? Um, and it's back on these voices thing. So maybe it's the environmental, the cultural, the economic or the local food security that's of most interest to you. And of course, most of us are here because we believe this system can tick lots of those boxes. Um, but to decide what species to plant, you need to listen to the voice inside of you and figure out what's the main voice that's speaking to me? What's my main outcome? And then the other ones will be added benefits to it. So let's look at some examples. Maybe the voice inside of you saying, actually, the reason I really want to do this is I want to restore native ecosystems. And if I can sell a bit of grain and make a bit of money, that's going to support my main goal. And my main goal is the ecosystems. So if that's the voice that you're hearing, for example, the implication might be you might want to include native legumes in your mix. So that he, that picture there is Cullentenax. That's a legume that grows up on country up here. Um, and if you've got environmental in, impacts in mind, you might want to include, even though that legume is, has non-edible grain, it might be one that you want to include in your system. I also hear a lot of people talking about how native grains um, are an important part of regenerative agriculture principles, including maintaining ground cover all year round. So the reason for this is most grain producing crops today, including barley and oats and wheat and then the non-native le the non legumes, sorry, like um, faba beans and chickpeas and lentils, whatnot, they're all annual crops, which means they grow for roughly six months of the year and the other six months, the ground is bare. Um, so one of the reasons a lot of people are interested in these grain systems is that the grasses stay there all year round. And it's really good for the soil, really good for water, um, really good for soil biota and the fauna and the flora that depend on it. So if that voice is the loudest one, um, you might want to consider a polyculture or a food pantry style, but one which can be managed. And it's that management question that's interesting in this regen ag space because there's lots of different regen ag principles that are applied in polycultures. Um, cover cropping and um, no-kill cropping, pasture cropping, which all, which all depend really on having a baseline level of ground cover. But normally in these principles that the natives would be your baseline and they'd be the understory and then the other crops you plant would be taller and more vigorous. So normally in those systems, and it's not the only answer, but commonly in regen ag, the tallest species are the ones where you get the grain from and the shorter species are the ones that maintain the ground cover and um, maintain the ecosystem. But with these natives, 
it, it will be the other way around. It will be the shorter ones, which you'd want to harvest the grain from, um, and the shorter and also less vigorous ones. And so the implications for being able to do a polyculture um, with incorporating introduced species into the same paddock, you're going to need to work on things like what time of year do the grasses go to seed, depending on um, what other plants I want to introduce into the mix, how I control weeds and how I control that in my final product. Interesting thoughts. Let's move on to another voice. Um, I'm learning a lot from the elders up here. And one of the phrases I hear commonly is healing and bringing back native grain food production um, is about healing people and connecting them to country and identity and, um, and that holistic connection that comes from when you just walk on country and you're there and you listen and you stop and you're part of it. Um, and so restoring the native grasses en masse on, at a big scale is really important for healing. And um, there's lots of other cultural voices. That, that's one example of something that I've taken on from the elders up here. Um, and your culture and um, your elders might have a different voice. Um, but in this example, for that particular voice, um, again, I think you'd probably want to look at a bit more of a food pantry style. So if the main purpose or your priority is about healing, you probably need lots of different species in a, in a small area and you're more likely going to be doing hand or small scale collection, like with a grass grabber, like what David had or something smaller like that um, in your particular paddock. So this photo was taken up at the living classroom at Bingara. I recommend a drop, drop by if you're ever in the area, um, but it shows here lots of different grass species and shrubs um, all in the same area, but many of them with important foods um, or maybe even medicinal properties all growing in the same area. Perhaps your priority is setting up an, an enterprise. Um, so a voice that has the economics at, um, as the priority and then the environmental or cultural or food security, it might also be in there, but the economics as the main priority. They might be thinking something like, I really want to employ young people in my community, I want to provide culturally significant or environmentally significant employment opportunities um, that also restore the land at the same time. But basically, I want to make sure there's jobs. So if the main priority is making sure that there's um, an economic output and therefore you can employ people to work the land, um, you might want to consider more of a, a food factory style, which is more efficient. Um, and this particular is this is one example of how it might work. So that's Callum. Big shout out to Callum. He's the technician on the grains project up here. And that's him harvesting with a leaf blower set on reverse. So it's kind of a leaf sucker, if you like, but he's actually using that to suck up the grains. And he's doing that on a smaller scale. Um, but that particular paddock, it's almost a monoculture of button grass that came up opportunistically um, from a farmer up here. And he let us, thank you, another, another John. Thank you, other John, for letting us harvest in your paddock. Um, and that paddock up there um, is an example of how you might produce something with a bit more economic efficiency at its core but it still has environmental implications because you've got a native species and it's not a true monoculture. There's others mixed in there as well um, with other, um, you can plant trees and shrubs on the edges of that um, to produce something that's got lots of different diversity outcomes for the native species, but also an economic outcome at its core. The other voice I hear often is about local food security. So for some of the more remote areas, getting healthy food is actually really expensive. So um, for example, at, at Walgut, when their supermarket burned down or out at, at Mungandai had a similar problem, really sad. Um, and then other communities where it's really hard to get um, fresh fruit and veg. And it's really hard to get fresh produce in general and get it cheaply. So um, being able to produce food locally is a priority. And you really need to use the native species in some of these more remote areas because the horticultural ones that are commercialized for the coast aren't going to work inland. So if local food security or health of your own community, because you can eat healthier foods cheaper, um, is your priority, then you probably want to look at a mosaic of different plants grown as monocultures or near monocultures in a small area. So there's a photo here, you've got two different grass species um, on either side of the road. Um, and then you've got down the bottom, when I took that photo, that paddock was bare, but um, that particular paddock could be sown to shrubs or fruits or vegetables or whatever, um, all in a mosaic pattern. 
So you've got lots of different plants and options for your food security outcomes, but the product per area will be fairly pure. So it's not too expensive or difficult to clean down. So it's got that, that safe and, and cheap food coming out of that area there. So I've talked for a little while and so is David. I just want to take one minute before I finish my talk um, for you guys, while this is on your mind, to have a quick think about your priorities. So I know some of the people listening to this are in a room with other people. So if you are, why don't you turn to the person next to you and discuss what you think the priorities are in your community or your business. Um, and if you're on your own, you might want to write on a bit of paper and start jotting down your thoughts. What am I really trying to accomplish in this space? Why do I want to do native grains? And try and, try and try and hear your own voice. Or if you want to write in the chat box and chat with each other in the chat box, that's also fine with me. I'll set a timer. We'll do one minute of quick discussion before I finish my talk. Go. Okay, I hope you had a good chat or a good think. Please continue to ask yourself and your community these questions. I can't answer them for you, no one else can. Um, please keep discussing this, thinking it through, and that'll help you know, okay, this is the approach I want to take when I decide how much money I'm gonna spend um, buying grain to be able to make a planting. Um, I'm trying to wake my screen up, okay. Last little bit of the talk, only 10 minutes left at the, at the most. The threshing roadblock. And David had, um, referred to this about the, for example, he talked about the contamination of turnip um, in that paddock, that same paddock. And being able to not just thresh, but also clean um, seed is what I believe is going to really open up this production chain. Because it, um, historically it's been done by hand. And it's amazing, the women that would sit there and men, um, either stirring or winnowing or um, using the yanding process, and then also grinding, burning, um, using even, I've heard water also being used in the threshing process. And these techniques have been used for thousands of years and so important. Um, and going forward, we need to consider how we're going to respectfully and with appropriate compensation, um, use this knowledge and combine it with other modern tools to be able to um, unblock the, this bit of the production chain because it's really expensive doing things by hand in, in a modern world. Um, so whilst there'll be a niche market for, um, for grains when they're done by hand, um, to really make this production chain tick on a big scale and get the big scale benefits being able to plant lots of area with lots of environmental and cultural benefits. We need to feed it to lots of people and which means we need to be able to access the market which doesn't want to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a loaf of bread. So the threat, I call it the threshing roadblock because currently it's so expensive and this is why. So this is a, a picture I took out of that paper down there that shows the morphology of a grass seed. And um, David held up some seed, I'm gonna try and do it as well. So that's a kangaroo grass set of florets there. Same principle, um, almost all grasses have this. So you have the stalk, then you have what are called glooms there, then you've got a lemma and a palea, and um, where those fluffy bits are, inside there, that's where the seed is. So the seed's 
held in between Alema and Palea, and then the whole seed head is held between glooms. And all of these different types of bracts go into your seed um, when you harvest it. So in a commercial situation for something like barley or oats or wheat, these things have had breeding to make them really easy to remove. So the, um, the header itself threshes the seed and removes the glooms, the lemons and the paleas and they fly out the back of the header and get left in the field and only the grain remains. But these native species, because for thousands of years they've needed these for their own reproduction, so they, they need glimmers, uh, looms, glooms and lemons and paleas to help them germinate and the awns and the hairs, it's all part of their seed dispersal and, and survival mechanisms. They've needed them um, and they've never been bred out, so they're still there today. Um, so if we're going to go forward, we need to figure out how to cheaply separate the grain from the non-edible bits. Can you eat glooms and lemons and paleas? Well, yes. Um, so these, this kangaroo grass here is still held within its lemma and paleo. Most of the glooms have been removed and the awns. Um, and there was one question in the chat box, how do you remove them? Well, great difficulty and it takes hours and hours of rubbing. <laughs> kangaroo grass is one of the worst and most painful ones to try and process. Um, but um, even with the lemmas and, and paleas on, yes, you can eat them. Um, but the more of this fibrous bracts that you include in your food sample, the more, in my opinion anyway, it tastes like grass. Um, and some of that flavour can be interesting, um, but it, it, it is a bit grassy. I think in general for a modern, modern market, we have to try and remove as much of that as we can to make it more palatable. And, um, and those, those bits, the bracts are very high in cellulose. They're not very well digested. So... I suppose if you say it's good for fibre, it's good for your gut, um, but it's also a bit fibrous. And so the taste of it is, is a bit unpleasant. If there's too much, a little bit's okay. So another shout out to the technician Callum that's up here. I wanna give him a good rap because he's worked very hard on threshing and he spent hours and hours and hours trying different methods of being able to thresh different species to food grade. Um, and David showed some examples of threshing to revegetation grade, which is great. So what we're trying to do is take it to the next level. So Callum says, step one, put a threshing board out, handful of grain, spread it out, make sure there's no sticks or cat head or other junk that could give you a pinch. Good advice. Um, and so what he was using was just a, a commercial float that he, we bought this from the hardware store and we just stuck a bit of rubber on the bottom as well. And we've tried rubber and we've tried different types of materials as well. And you rub them back and forth but even then, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes you need to use here. So this is similar to the grinding stone concept, but this is um, just a mortar and pestle that we purchased from the supermarket. Um, basically two stones rubbing on each other, um, but not in a culturally appropriate way. This is just from Woolies. So step three would be you tip the grain through a sieve and you see what grain you've got. And then step four, if you need to go back and do a bit more rubbing, um, you might wanna use a mortar and pestle. And this is how you might do it in a modern context with some cheaply available materials by hand. But obviously we need to take this to the next level. So can, what machines do we currently have available um, to separate grain from trash? So the one that's on the far left is a commercially available simple one that you can buy um, for your, in, if you wanna try this yourself. That's just a crank, it's two bits of metal rubbing on each other. The middle one is a small threshing machine so this is the same concept as what's in a commercial header. It's just um, something that you, can, you have a bit more control over the fan speed and the belt speed, and you can put it in and out several times. Um, and it comes out different holes. So you can capture both what might be trash and what might be grain in different holes coming out of the machine. There's many, many different versions of threshers you can buy um, for small scale production. The final one that's in there uh, at the end, this is the very capable Isabella. Um, and she's programming this seed sorter to be able to recognise what's a target and what's a not, not target. So the idea is that the seed goes in the hopper at the top and then it comes down through this chute here and it passes underneath the computer and the computer scans the seed as it goes past and it decides if it's a good seed, it will fling it into one bucket. If it's a non-target seed, it'll fling it into another bucket. And this machine is commercially available if you've got $60,000 to spare. Um, so obviously this sort of technology is there, but is it accessible to everyone? 
not quite yet. Um, I think we are going to have these options available and it will be important. But one of the reasons why I've, I've really wanted to bring people together is to talk about, well, maybe if we, if we combine our forces, if different mobs and different groups and um, different people producing things want to go in together um, to be able to produce seed in a, in a very pure way with an expensive machine, it might take those economies of scale, lots of people working together to be able to afford a machine like this. But it's there, it's possible. Um, but a bit more R&D is needed. So to summarise this point, um, and David mentioned it as well, seed is very tra trashy when it's first harvested. And if the step one that David was talking about is suitable for revegetation, so the seed that's going back out for sowing. But if you're getting seed that needs to be sold as a food, there needs to be a step two of cleaning. And it's really labour intensive, time consuming and difficult. And different species have different levels of difficulty. Kangaroo grass is one of the worst ones that I've tried. Mitchell grass is also pretty bad um, of even the bigger, bigger seeded types. Um, native millet and microlina, believe it or not, some of the easier ones, even, and the, but even though those ones are fairly difficult. It's the biggest cost in the marketing chain and we need more R&D and more knowledge sharing to be able to figure out how to bring this cost down. This is my final point. Thanks everyone that has stuck around. I know that this has gone way over time. The question about breeding and um, this is about intervention in something that's native and natural and I want to talk a little bit about the implications of doing this. So firstly, what is breeding? There are two steps. Step one is you need to make the plant that you want or get the plant that you want. That's the breeding step. And the second step in breeding is about removing the old plants and replacing it with your improved plant, your improved variety or genotype. So what are the options for step one, getting the plant that you like? So the most simple format that we can use is just basically going to a wild population with the appropriate legal and cultural oversight and picking the best plants and regrowing those ones. So you might go to a big field and say, that plant's got really big heads, that plant's really drought tolerant, that plant um, has easy to harvest seed, um, whatever, whatever trait you're looking for. Or you might look at a trait like this one's got really high protein, this one's got really high, low fiber or high fiber, whatever you're looking at. And you just pick the best ones and you regrow those individual best ones. That's the most simple level of breeding. It's actually not even breeding, it's just selecting plants. The next thing you can try is you select those two, two plants that you like and then you cross them. So it'd be kind of like if you want to crossbreed dogs, like if you want to get a labradoodle, you cross a labrador and a poodle. So you could do the same concept with the grasses. You get one that's high in um, protein and one that yields really well and you cross them together and some of the offspring will be both high in protein and yield really well. So that's the, that's the simplest level of breeding. The next thing you might try is closely related species. So for example, if you wanted to um, cross different species of Mitchell grass, there's several different closely related species. Some have really long heads, some produce more biomass of plant, that might make them more suitable for grazing. Um, maybe you want to do some interspecies crosses in something like that. Then the final and the most complicated and expensive version of breeding, and this is a very simplistic model, um, is where you're not actually crossing plants, but you're taking the genes of a species and you're inserting them artificially into your target species. So you might take a gene out of a bacteria or a, bacteria, a gene out of a fungus or a virus and you insert that into a plant and it makes it grow better for whatever reason. That is the true definition of genetically modified plants according to the UN. So this is when you're inserting individual genes. Um, and so when we're now we're talking about the native grains food system. Um, and some people say we don't want to do plant breeding because it changes things. I just want to put in, in context, there's different levels of breeding and people are comfortable with different types. So almost everyone I've spoken to is comfortable with kind of these two options, selecting the best plants and crossing them, or even just selecting the best plants. Um, this is a, is a process that can occur in nature, and it's just human beings giving it um, a management direction. Um, and um, most people are comfortable with this. Um, not many people, including consumers, are comfortable with this at this stage. 
So I think let's all just go with what we're happy with and what we agree with and not freak out about this happening. Um, I'd, I'd suggest let's work on a little bit of simple natural plant breeding to improve the native species and that will make them easier to grow or easier to harvest, easier to process um, without modifying them in a very, um, a very a high level of intervention, let me put it that way. Um, but step two is also very important in plant breeding and that is you have to replace the current plants you have in the field with your new plant. And this requires quite a high level of intervention. And I think people need to remember this and it's quite different with grasses than it is with horticultural species. And let me show why. So imagine you've got a set of trees and there's dozens of them. And you say, I've got a new improved variety of this tree, like it might be a, a fruit producing tree or whatever, even a native one. And I wanna remove the current trees and, re and replant with my current improved variety. So you could knock down or burn those old trees and replant um, seedlings and the seedlings would regrow. And it might take seven years or whatever to get them up to fruiting, but you've now removed the old variety and re replaced it with something that's improved. I think people can picture how that might happen. But if you're doing this with grasses, you've got thousands and thousands of grasses, not only there currently, but also the seed bank, which is sitting in the soil, where you've got thousands and thousands of seed of grasses that's going to re-sprout um, over the next um, five to 10 years. So not only do you have to remove the grasses that are currently there, but you also have to consider removing the grasses in the seed bank because they will compete with your improved variety that you've sown. And is that a good or a bad thing? Again, it comes back to your priorities, where you feel comfortable and what the goal is of your particular enterprise. But just you just got to remember in the plant breeding process, the reason why this is, has worked and been integrated into modern cropping systems is because every year you have to replant the grass anyway. So whether it's all, all legume or whatever it is. So you're replanting these annual crops every year. So it's really easy to incorporate new varieties into the system. But when you've got perennial plants with a deep seed bank that have been there for many, many decades, um, that level of intervention is gonna require removing probably for several years the old stuff so that you can replant with your new and yes you can have this kind of swing where you've got your your old variety and you've still got some of those and you've got some of your new one in the same paddock and people might be comfortable with that and that's going to be appropriate and i'd say probably quite common going forward not a bad thing i'm just um, putting this in context to help you make some decisions as we share knowledge around this system final slide i promise um, the benefits of breeding, breeding are big though. And I'm a, I'm a plant breeder, so I'm very biased, but I'm a big advocator of this simple level of breeding. This photo here is one of the wild relatives of wheat. This is called joint, jointed goat grass. Um, there's several wild relatives of wheat. This is one of them. You can see how it's got small heads, lots of tillers, small grains. This next photo is wheat as it looks like today. So you can see the massive difference, the improvement that plant breeding has made in the yield of these grains per hectare. So I just want to say for something like Mitchell grass, there really is room for breeding to improve the variety. Because I mean, if you look at this, these are again, just like Mitchell grass, different ages, different heights, different levels of, of you know, different heights. That one's a bit taller and these ones are a bit shorter. Um, you know, it's, it's really, if you look at it like that, it's not that different to Mitchell grass. Um, and so there is hope to increase the yields from let's say 0.2 tonnes of per hectare. Maybe we can get up to one tonne per hectare by just selecting and maybe a few simple crosses. I don't know, um, but I'd like to think we can. And I think there's, there's room for investing in this um, with the appropriate cultural oversight, and that's really important, um, and with the appropriate legal oversight as well, so that we can get this right um, and really improve the yields going forward. So to finish with, discuss what level of breeding you're comfortable with. Um, remember though, that it is gonna require a high level of intervention in the actual paddock when it comes time to improve, introducing these new lines, but the benefits are really, really high. So in conclusion, talk about your priorities. Think about the voices in the marketing chain, think about your own voices, um, and then let's work forward, look forward how we can integrate this knowledge together um, into a, 
appropriate marketing chain. So that's it from me. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've, I've noticed there's heaps and heaps and heaps of points in the chat box. And, oh great, I'm looking now, there's some really, really great points, um, references to papers, um, articles. Yep, fantastic, yes please. Um, please do share more knowledge in that chat box. We'll be open for another minute or so. If you have a business that you'd like to advertise that's in this space, I'm very happy for you to use the chat box for that as well. And I know that's rare. Um, I'm not endorsing any businesses, but I think it's important we share knowledge and find out and connect with each other over this virtual platform. Um, if you have more resources and things you want to add there, great. If you have more questions, and I'll try and go back through and try and answer a few of them if I can um, at a later stage. Um, and finally, if you're one of those groups that was emailed um, a separate link by Cara Jeffrey this morning or before um, to be involved in a post meeting discussion. Um, just a quick reminder, you'll have to close this meeting and re click on that new link to be able to participate in the discussion. So thanks again for everyone for participating. Thank you to David Carr for what you shared as well. Um, and thank you everyone for being part of knowledge sharing and I'd really look forward to the next session. The next session is on business models and appropriately, how to appropriately do this in the cultural context as well as the legal context um, of the modern world. So we really need to um, talk more and discuss how this might work. And we're gonna have Chris Andrews, who's the Managing Director of Black Duck Foods, which is um, Bruce Pascoe's company on Ewan Country, talking about how they set up their native grains enterprise with cultural oversight um, and also how um, the legal implications of how they made it a registered charity and things like that. So um, he's going to talk about his experience. We'll also have Bet Cross sharing from some more experiences that she's um, talked with Aboriginal people um, across the country. And then finally, we're going to finish with Tony Metham, and he's going to talk about training and education opportunities for people that really want a little bit of training and formal training to be able to enter this space. Um, so for example, if you want to start an enterprise and you need a bit of knowledge on either the horticultural principles or you need some information on baking or you need some information on training in, in business models or whatever, um, Tony's going to give a few minutes on some ways that we can get that training free um, so you can enter this space. So thank you everyone again, appreciate your time, have a wonderful day, um, go the blues and I'll see you guys next session 11am um, on Tuesday next week. Bye.